All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Go ahead and put that first slide up. We want to talk about the two covenants. I want to know uh, what do you think of whenever you see the two covenants. Let's, let's look at that next slide and let's, let's look at a, a page in my Bible. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it is the opening page once you get beyond the, the preface and once you get beyond all of these other things. There is that table of contents. And it's been my privilege and uh, a bl what a blessing it is to talk to a Hindu who's never seen a Bible. Here's where I begin. Open up the Bible and you just say, now look, there are two main parts to the Bible. Go ahead and put up that main, main part slide there because you know what those two main parts are, you, do you not? There is the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a table of contents. And uh, I know you already know this. You already know how many books there are in the Old Testament. How many books are there in the Old Testament? Go ahead and just as a matter of verbalizing, how many? 39. How many books in the New Testament? And so you've got that many books in the New Testament. Here's one a little bit harder. From the time the first book of the Bible was written until the last book of the Bible, how many years does it span? And I'm talking about not historically, you know, we, we know uh, uh, historically, uh, you know, can get back pretty close to the time when the earth was created. But I'm talking about how many years were involved from the time the first book was written until the last book was written. About, if I say about how many years, you cannot give a wrong answer. You may miss it by 10,000 years, but you'd still be right. About how many years from the time if Moses wrote Genesis, and he did, uh, about how many years from Moses until the last book of the New Testament is written? 1,500 or 1,600 years, about 1,600 years. And uh, we do not, uh, do not understand. How many men wrote the Bible? All right. About 40 men wrote the Bible. And so uh, the one book we do not know for sure when it was written is the book of Job. We do not even know who wrote the book of Job. The Jews recognize it as an inspired book. And so... That's, the, that's, uh, that's why it is included, why it is in, included, uh, uh, included in the Bible. Now then, <coughs> when you think of the word covenant, what do you think of when, when you talk about, when, when, when you're talk, talking about the fact that, that there are two covenants? Well, a covenant is a way to describe how God has related himself to individuals. The first time the first time the word the, the, the first time the word covenant is, is, is found in the Bible is in Genesis 6. God makes a covenant with Noah, if you will build the ark, I will save you alive. It, it, it's not stated if then in that way, but the first time the word is used. God it says God made a covenant with Noah. And uh, there's that other covenant that we're far more ready, uh, readily acquainted with. But the last verse of Genesis chapter 6 says, Noah did what everything God told him to do. And so God gives him the instruction, but the word covenant is used. It repented God that he had made man, and so God makes a covenant with Noah. That helps us understand, understand what a covenant is. We, we know the, uh, uh, that, that, that other covenant, we, we know, we know that, that, that covenant even better because uh, in this passage, in Genesis chapter 6 through 8, God makes a promise to Noah, and there is the sign of the covenant. The, sign, the, the, the covenant he made with Noah was, he'd, you build the ark and I'll keep you alive, but after they come out of the ark, there is the sign of another covenant that God makes. Uh, what's that sign? That's the rainbow. Well, it's a sign of what? It's a covenant between God and mankind. That one thing, by the way, will help you understand that the flood was universal. If, if, it, was, if it was only a local flood, there are all kinds of problems with trying to explain away the ark and or explain away all of that that's in the Bible because think of how many times there's been local floods. I mean, there are some individuals who try to say, oh, it's a myth, it's a legend, it never really, really happened. Well, the rainbow is proof that the flood was universal. The Bible says, you know, I will never again do what I have done. 
And that is to destroy the earth, to destroy the earth with a flood. And that in and of itself. Now then, what is a covenant? Well, we, we, we use uh, uh, in, in the next one words to describe what a covenant is. We know this. It's just a matter of, of, of how do you verbalize it. I use three words to describe what a covenant is. A covenant is an agreement. It is a promise. It is a contract. That's what it is. You've got the old agreement, that old promise, that old uh, contract that God made with the Jews at Mount Sinai. You stop and you think about it is a way to describe the relationships that God has with man. Now there, that old covenant, and we'll obviously look at this in greater detail, and, and just so you'll be aware, this lesson tonight is introductory. We have two weeks to, to introduce this covenant. Uh, we then have the prayer meeting on Wednesday night, uh, the week before the gospel meeting. We have the gospel meeting itself. So uh, now, all of a sudden, instead of 10 lessons, I've got eight lessons to talk about the two covenants. And at least uh, part of these first two weeks are going to be to lay the framework and the groundwork. Some of the things that we will, if we have time to look at them tonight, we'll look at them in greater detail when we get to weeks, you know, four, five, and six, that type of thing. But I'm trying to introduce this by saying God has had covenants with men. He made a covenant with Abraham. Threefold promise called a covenant. There was the sign of that covenant, circumcision. And so the word covenant is found, it's found nearly 300 times in the Bible. We don't think about it because we think of the two covenants. And so I want you to understand that uh, it is a covenant, it's an agreement, a contract made regarding relationship between individuals. And we understand this when we talk about the life's will and testament. We'll talk about that word testament in just a minute, but a testament is a covenant. And so you make your life, you write your life's will and covenant. What, what do you do? You make a, a covenant with your descendants, with the state of Florida. It is, it is an agreement. When I die, this is the way I want things to happen. Now that very argument is used in relationship to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 9 that says, where there is a testament, there must be the death of a testator. And a testament is a force only after men are dead. So a testament is a specialized kind of a, a, of a covenant. And so there is that old covenant, and that's biblical language, there is that new covenant. That is their Old Testament, and there is that, there is that uh, New Testament. And then you think about a, a marriage covenant. What is that? It is an agreement between two individuals till death do us part. That, that's what that is. And so when we talk about the two covenants, let's not just have some nebulous idea up here in the air about what a covenant is. Let's... let's uh, Let's, let's understand exactly what we're talking about. It is two ways God has had a relationship with men on this earth. And we're talking specifically about the covenant at Mount Sinai and the covenant uh, at, at, at Mount Golgotha. Both of them came uh, from the mountain. And, and, and so we, need to, we, we, we need, to, need to understand and have an appreciation of that. Now we talked about the word testament. The word testament is a New Testament word. It's not found in the Old Testament. Every time in the Old Testament this relationship is described, the word covenant is used. Now there's some other words that we'll look at that was used to describe that covenant. But that when we talk about the Old Covenant, and the New Testament refers to the Old Testament as the Old Covenant. And so it's not some arbitrary thing that we've, uh, we've invented to talk about the two covenants. That the, this is Bible language to describe God's relationship to people in former times. And that, that word testament in the, the, in the New King James Bible, the one we have in the pew, 
That word testament is found only three times in the New King James. I was amazed when I, when I discovered this, but uh, what really amazed me more is it, it's found, uh, uh, it's found 14 times in the Old King James. And so we can Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, and, that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's biblical language, and it, gets, gets, it, it enables us to get a concept of that Old Testament and that New Testament, 39 books, 27 books. We've got that understanding of it in, uh, in, in, in relationship. So in this study, I'm going to use the words interchangeably perhaps. So I'm not going to try to just all the time say covenant or all the time to say testament because the Bible uses those words to describe, to describe them. There may be a specialized emphasis on the word testament, but that, that's not what we're going to do. Now, the, the Bible clearly talks about the fact that there are two covenants. Uh, you, 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 begin, you begin looking at this and open up your Bibles. Look in, look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, pardon me, Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is one verse you need to know where it is in the Bible. Uh, it, it, because it is so uh, emphatic that in a religious discussion, in talking to other individuals, you need to know where this is in the Bible. If you've got a blank page in the back of the Bible, I would urge you to write down in Deuteronomy chapter 5 as the evidence of the, the two covenants. There are some things stated here so clearly, and they're stated so clearly because they're not stated this clearly elsewhere in the Bible. Here's Moses at the end of his life. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The names that are given to those books, where does the word Genesis come from? Do you know the Greek word for Genesis? Can you quote Genesis 1-1? In the beginning. Genesis means beginning. And so whenever they were naming the books of the Bible, they, the name they gave was the Greek name for in the beginning. Exodus starts the life of Moses. So in the, in the books of Moses, you've got Genesis from the creation until the time the descendants of Jacob go down into the land of Egypt. Exodus says, and the children of Jacob, what's Jacob's other name? Israel. And the children of Israel multiplied in the land of Egypt. There, there, there's not a break between the two. In spite of the fact there's several hundred years involved, you get to the end of the book of Genesis, and Jacob, Joseph says, when you go back, carry my bones, because God's going to come someday and lead you out. And chapter, when you get to Exodus chapter 1, it, is, it, is a, it, is, it continues the chronology, if that's a good way to describe it. So you've got, the, you've, got, you've, got the, you've got the Exodus, you've got Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. What is that? How does this word, how does this uh, book get its name, Deuteronomy? Well, if you look at the first four letters and, uh, and be dyslexic, you'll be able to know how this book got its name. And now if I tell you the word nomos, nomos, and that's Deuteronomos, you hear that in that? Nomos means law. Look at the first four letters of the, of the name of, uh, of this book and be, be uh, uh, dyslexic and you come up with what word? You come up with the word duet. Two, nomos. Second, law. Where is the law first mentioned? Well, it's first mentioned back the giving of the law in the book of Exodus. Where's the first time you read the Ten Commandments? Where's the first time you read the, the Ten Nomos, the Ten Laws? It's halfway through the book of Exodus. It's at Mount Sinai. It's in that historical part of the book of Exodus. Now, those same Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy. And that's where this book gets its name. It is Second Law. And it's given that name because of the content that's there. So you see the first time those Ten Commandments are given are in Exodus 20. 
And the second time those commandments are given is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And it, it is that very uh, uh, fact, that, that it's that very truth that allows us to know that there is Genesis, beginning, Exodus, going out. Leviticus, first four words of Leviticus, Levi. What was the priestly tribe? Where did the priest come from? The tribe of Levi. And so if you want to read about all of these sacrifices, look at Leviticus. That's what's in that book. And then the fourth book is Numbers, and it talks about the taking of a census. They, took a, they numbered the people at Mount Sinai. Before Moses dies and before they go into the promised land, they number them again. So the book of Numbers covers about 40 years. You get to the book of Deuteronomy and you get to the last month of Moses' life. In fact, it is almost as though when he writes chapter 32 or 34, I guess, of Deuteronomy, I forgot how many chapters there are, when he, when, he, when he finishes writing chapter 34, he goes up into the mountains and dies the last month of his life. And so he calls those individuals together. And this, listen to these words. There are truths here that you will not fully understand until you, until you know this. Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, listen, Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. You know what that covenant is? It is the Old Covenant. It's the Old Testament. And the Bible says, when they arrived at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb, another name for that mountain. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same mountain. You might want to put a note in your Bible where you have Horeb. You might, to put, you might want to put notation in the margin of your Bible, another name for Mount Sinai. And so Moses has all of the Jews that are there and he said, the Lord made our covenant, a covenant with us at, uh, 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 at, at Mount Horeb. And then he says, the Lord did not make this covenant with the fathers. Wait a minute, who's the fathers? Well, what about Adam? What about Enoch? What about Methuselah? What about Noah? What, uh, 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 what about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the father of the Jewish nation? We talk about being Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord did not make this covenant with the Father. Now, what does that mean? Here's the 2,500 years of Genesis, and or the 2,000 years of Genesis, and the 2,500 years from the creation until they arrive at, at, uh, uh, at Mount Sinai, the Lord did not make this covenant with the fathers. Did he have other covenants? Yeah. One of the commandments is, thou shall not kill. How far do you read in Genesis before the Lord is bringing judgment on a man because he killed somebody? Who's the first person that killed a human? That, you know, that's Cain. Cain killed his brother. What's his name? His, what's his, Cain killed who? All right. Cain killed his brother Abel. Was there consequences? Was it wrong for him to do that? Absolutely. And so you've got, you've got all of these covenants, all of these laws that God gave, but they were not written, on, they not, they were not written down. These commandments were not written down like they were at Mount Sinai. When Moses walks off that mountain, the first time he walks off, he has tablets of stone that the Lord himself uh, had cut out of the mountains. It's Moses who makes 
cuts them tablets out the second time when, you know, Moses comes off that mountain and he has on those two tables of stones the Ten Commandments. Who wrote the words of the Ten Commandments on that stone? God did. The finger of God wrote those Ten Commandments. And folks, that's the first Bible. It's the first written time the commandments of God were written down is at that time. Abraham have a Bible? Nope. Isaac have a Bible? Nope. You know, Jacob have a Bible? Nope. You know, Noah have a Bible? No. Did he know how to live? You better believe he did. The Lord made a covenant with Noah, remember? That's not covenant with a capital C. If to talk about the old covenant and the new covenant, that's a specialized use. But there, the covenant of circumcision. Where'd that come from? It came from God telling Abraham, you do this and you tell your descendants to do this. And so, and so uh, what you have here, what, what you have here is they, the, the Lord says, Moses says, the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers. Then, then he says, but with us, those of us who are here today, all of us who are, who are alive. And then he describes how that covenant was given. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain, he said. What happened? When they arrived at Mount Sinai, unlike, unlike what is uh, depicted in that movie, The Ten Commandments, and, uh, do they still show that movie, Ten Commandments? You know, it's... it's uh, <laughs> It, it, it's, it, it's so, uh, the color in it is so bad, it's, it, it might have been better if it was black and white. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, the color, coloration and everything is not there. But in that movie, everybody believes that Moses went up to the mountain, and that's where he got the Ten Commandments, and the Lord said, get off this mountain. And he came down the, um, off the mountain, and they were worshiping a golden calf. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. They did not have the commandment, thou shalt not make any graven image. How do they know they were not supposed to make the graven image? And that's the problem if you build your Bible knowledge on the movie Ten Commandments. You know what happened? They arrived at Mount Sinai and the Lord's voice spoke that says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the people heard the voice of God. Can you imagine what that had to be like? The mountain's on fire. You want to talk about volcano? You want to talk about earthquakes? You want to talk about that smoke that covered the top of that mountain? We don't have enough imagination to understand. And the voice of God. You think God whispered that? God does not talk in whispers. You look how the voice of God rings clearly. And so somebody said, well, the Lord gave me a message the other night and whispered into my ear, this is what, I, listen, that's not the way God speaks in the Bible. When God speaks in the Bible, you're going to know that God, God speaks in the Bible. And, and so Moses uh, stood there and the people were scared, scared to death and they said, don't let God talk to us anymore. You, Moses, you go back up into the mountain. You know what the book of Hebrews said Moses' emotions were like when he walked up into that fire? What would your emotions have been? You are walking into an earthquake and smoke and fire, and you're walking up into that mountain. And Moses says, I, even I, did exceedingly, you hear the words? exceedingly fear and quake. It was not just the earth that was quaking. Moses was quaking when he went up into that mountain. And so when he gets up there, that's when God gives them the, uh, in a written form the Ten Commandments. Now, somebody said Moses was the most wicked man in the Bible. You ever heard that? He came off of that mountain and broke all Ten Commandments in five seconds. 
You remember what he did? He took the tables of stone and threw them down and they, they shattered. That doesn't mean he was evil, but I mean, that's just a, uh, a play on words and a play on the things that happened. So he goes back up into the mountain the second time. And this time Moses uh, takes the tablets of stone up there. They have the, very, they have the words of God. Now, look at this. The Lord talk with you, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 4, talk with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you, and you did not go up to the mountain. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Recognize that? Yeah. Ten commandments. Second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven images. Uh, I don't know if, if I will be able to, uh, uh, to, to do all of this, but my neighbor just moved in uh, about a year ago, and they got little children, and uh, their little four- or five-year-old boy knows the Ten Commandments. I was, I was, talking, to them, the little, I was talking to them about you need to decide how, to, how you raise your children. You've you got to teach them to tell the truth. Are you aware that thou shall not bear false witness, thou shall not tell a lie, is one of the big ten. And I'm not talking about football. <laughs> it's one of the big ten, one of the big ten commandments. That's, and she said, uh, called a little boy by name, he came over there, said, tell this man the ten commandments. Five years of age, grandparents, listen to this. Those who are teaching our children in Sunday school, second, third, and fourth grade, or not second, third, and fourth grade, two grades, two, three, age two, three, and four, Ten Commandments, one God, no idols. Uh, the, the, the third commandment, no cursing. Take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And he said, and go to church every Sunday. I, I would teach it to, you know, worship God. That's the fourth commandment. And the fifth commandment says, don't kill anybody. Don't kill, in, uh, don't kill anybody. Um, Let's see. No, but fourth commandment is honor. Do what your mom and daddy tell you to do. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill anybody. Don't do bad things. <laughs> How do you teach your little children not to commit adultery? Don't do bad things. Don't steal. Don't tell any lies. And don't, don't uh, desire to have something that, somebody, that belongs to somebody else. How's that? Thou shalt teach these things diligently unto your children and talk of it when you're lying down, when you're rising up. You got grandchildren perhaps on the way. Ricky, you and Peggy, you need to, you need to hear me. <laughs> Those kids are going to marry out there and everything. And, and you need to teach these Ten Commandments. I was astounded. And Gary, I wish I had known that when you were four. I don't know if I could have gotten your attention long enough to teach you these things but isn't that a great way to teach it to a little four or five year old kid and his little sister, his little sister who was two years of age when it came, go to church every Sunday. They did. And this means go to church every Sunday. And so she did the hand action when it came to that one. Before he ever said go to church every Sunday, she was doing the hand action. These things are so important and you've got to understand it. Now then, look back in chapter 4 and verse, verse 13. This is critical. He declared unto you his covenant. This is Moses talking to the same group of individuals. So he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments and wrote them on two tablets of stone. What's the covenant? The whole basis of that Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. Now get this, and don't misunderstand it. If the covenant includes, or the, if the covenant is the Ten Commandments, what does that say about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob keeping the Sabbath? He did, he did not make this covenant with our fathers. What does that say about Noah keeping the Sabbath? Isn't that amazing? Uh, and we, need, we really, really need to understand that. And we may spend some time talking about this 
because they are men, individuals that struggle with the fact that the Lord blessed us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, uh, where it says the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. But Moses is writing that after Mount Sinai. Moses is looking back at all of that history and said that uh, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Look down in verse 12 of this chapter. Uh, well, well, yeah, uh, well, chapter 5 again, I'm sorry. Chapter 5, verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord commanded you. Six days you shall work, the seventh day on it nobody is to work, even your animals that are, are, are not to work. Now look at chapter, verse 15, key verse in understanding the two commandments. Remember, rem, wait a minute, that, that's what, isn't that what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath day? Exodus description of the Sabbath day is to do what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What am I to remember on that day? Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Why was the Sabbath given? It was given as a rest day, and on that day they were to remember what had happened in the land of Egypt and they are to rest on that day. It was not a worshiping day. They stayed at home, the design of it. They didn't come together in a synagogue, you know, in the Old Testament. In fact, the word synagogue is not even, as we understand it, is not even used in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? Synagogue is a thing that develops it's highly developed by the time you get to the New Testament and the Jews are coming together on, on Saturday in a, in a synagogue. But that is not the design of it. It was a design for a man to stay home with his family and talk about how good God is and what God had done there, had done for them. That was the design of it. And we may spend some more time on that, particularly because of the, the, the religious group, the Seventh-day Adventists, because of their failure to understand this and the fact that many uh, have followed the have followed the have followed the Adventist uh, uh, you know in, in that understanding of it but look don't listen to what Dan says don't you believe a thing that Dan has said believe that God said he did not make this covenant with the fathers Dan did not say that God said that. Did not make what covenant with the fathers, the previous chapter, even the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, you know, one, one God and, and, and no idols and no, uh, and, and no cursing and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, go to church every Sunday and, uh, you know, and, and do what your mom and daddy tell you to do. Uh, that's the Ten Commandments. That's what God gave. And he did not make this, these commandments to the fathers. Now then, I spent a whole lot longer there than, than, than I intended to. But I want you to understand that when God gave that Old Testament, it was not designed to be a permanent arrangement. Look in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, if, I don't know if you make notes in your Bible, but beside, uh, you know, uh, 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 the Lord did not make this covenant with the fathers. It, 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 you know, uh, in, in chapter, uh, uh, pardon me, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 4, I would write Jeremiah 31, 31, just so you'll be able to know where this is. You've got, you need to understand this. He gave a covenant at Mount Sinai, even Ten Commandments, that He did not make with their fathers. Now then, look in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. What's that? 
the days are coming when I'll make a New Testament. The days are coming that I will make a New Testament with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to that old covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenants they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. I am going to make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made, to the, made with their fathers. You want to know why we don't worship on Saturday? Because the Sabbath is the seventh day. We don't worship on the Sabbath day. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. That when, when, you, when you come phraseology like that, those words are not even found in the Bible. Is Sunday the day the New Testament church worship? No question at all about it. But I don't have any right to call Sunday a day of rest because the Saturday was a day of rest. On that day, you're to rest. And uh, yet that influence in America, some of you are old enough to remember when the shops did not even open on Sunday. You remember that? If you are, you, you know, you're, 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 telling, you're, you're advancing your years, you know. What, what were those laws called? Blue laws. Is that what they were? I, forget, I think that's what those laws were called. Now then, now then, so he says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, I am going to make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their, fa with their fathers. The old covenant said, Thou shalt not kill. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you. You see the contrast? Here is the Ten Commandments. Here's one of the Ten Commandments specifically mentioned by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 that says, Thou shalt not kill. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you. There's the Old Covenant. Here's the New Covenant. And the Bible says it's a better covenant. You know why it's better? Because of what Jesus said. Jesus said, to paraphrase what he says, don't even hate your brother. Isn't that amazing? You tell me which one of those commandments is greater. Which is the better covenant? The old commandment said, thou shalt not do bad things. To quote my little four or five year old neighbor, what God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, to lust after her, has already committed adultery in his heart. Which of those covenants is better? There's no question about that. And so we need to understand the Bible clearly shows that there, that there are these, uh, that, 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 that they are, there are these, there, there are these, the, these two commandments and, and emphatically uses, uses the word covenant, the, the very words that we're talking about, an old covenant, an old testament. There is an old testament and the Bible said in the old testament that it's not going to be permanent. Now, we'll look eventually in Hebrews chapter 8, where this very first verse from Jeremiah chapter 31 is quoted, and it says, and this new covenant is the New Testament. The Hebrew writer look, quotes this very verse and says, it's not, it, it has now come. God promised I will make a new covenant and it has, that, that, that uh, it is permanent. Look at these, these, these things. The second covenant is not the same as the first covenant. That's what Jeremiah 31 says. Now, why was the old covenant given? Well, 
Look in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 tells you why whenever he brought those individuals out of, brought them out of the uh, land of Egypt, why did he give them uh, these commandments? Look in verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? What law? That Old Testament law, that's the context. What's the purpose of that law? That law was added because of transgression. Wait a minute. What happened when they had no written law in Noah's day? What happened to the world? Without a code of ethics, sin multiplies and sin multiplies. Look uh, in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 says, verse 20, the law entered in that the, off that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Contextually, here is what, what uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. One translation says, The law came in that sin might be magnified. Why did God give that Old Testament law? To magnify sin. As long as it's just sort of word of mouth handed down from Adam and to Noah and to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Joseph down in the land of Egypt says, I cannot commit adultery. Why? God doesn't want me to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. Ever been driving down the highway and seen the speed limit sign? You know what that sign does? It magnifies your sin. And when you've got these ten commandments from God, sin is magnified. But he says in Romans 5, and where sin is magnified, grace is magnified. That's a stopping point. I am not ready to stop. Uh, next Wednesday night we'll take up here. I'm... Th I'm three slides out of about a 15 slides I wanted to cover tonight, okay? That's terrible. Okay, you are dismissed.